Hello, I'm Philip Chase. Welcome to my YouTube channel on the best of fantasy. Have you ever heard someone dismiss the entire genre of fantasy as escapist drivel and frippery? Usually people who say such things don't even read fantasy, and often they suffer from the lack of an imagination. I know I've heard that claim many times before, and actually it's one of the reasons why I wanted to start this YouTube channel. I want to show how many works of fantasy are in fact worthy of critical attention and exploration. And so as I hope today's video on the origins and development of fantasy will show, fantasy has always contained deep psychological and social insights. So let's get started. And let's begin with myth and legends and folk tales. These share many elements in common with modern fantasy, including magic and strange beasts and creatures, and sometimes even gods. Uh, it's, this is not an accident since fantasy took inspiration from myths and legends and folk tales, what I will in this video refer to as ancient tales. And actually I've done a, a video on uh, ancient tales that uh, people who read fantasy might like to check out and I'll put a link to that video in the description below. However, fantasy is not the same as ancient tales, and I think there are actually two important distinctions, at least two. The first is the collective nature of ancient tales. Uh, ancient tales typically emerged over thousands of years, uh, often in an oral form, until they were written down in some form or other. Fantasy, on the other hand, is the invention of an individual. And sometimes the individual creates an entirely made up world and often enough the individual takes a cue from ancient stories. It's a bit like uh, Joseph Campbell's distinction in The Hero with a Thousand Faces between myth and dream, where he says that uh, dream is the personalized myth, myth the personalized dream. A fantasy, in a sense, can be a personalized myth. The second distinction um, is very much related to the first, and that is the element of belief. Uh, ancient tales involved at least some level of belief in the creatures that inhabited them and in the magic, whereas the creators of fantasy uh, acknowledged that the work is a complete fiction. Now, for thousands of years, myths, legends, and folk tales with their fantastical elements were the dominant mode of storytelling. However, by the time of the Enlightenment and the Scientific Revolution, that all changed. Belief in the fantastic waned, and by the 1700s, realism was prized in fiction as serious fiction, whereas ancient tales uh, became less respected in the domain of children and simple folk. Also, the Industrial Revolution and the creation of a modern capitalist economy created a society in which the ancient tales increasingly felt like relics of a distant past. But the predominance of uh, realism, and also you throw in capitalism and industrialism, and all of this spurred a counter movement. And this is a very important point that I really want to kind of dwell on here. From the beginning, fantasy was always more than escapist entertainment. Though, of course, it is entertaining as well. And it has always had the function of nurturing the imagination. After all, what could be more human than the capacity to imagine? Inherent in fantasy, and sometimes even very explicit, are some social critiques. And you could also argue that fantasy performs the same important psychological functions that myths, legends, and folk tales always performed. Which is to say that fantasy provides an opportunity to step away from the mundane and vicariously take part in a journey, a transformative journey, that leads to new visions. Now back to our history. By the early 19th century, the counter movement of romanticism had taken off and part of it was a renewed interest in ancient tales. The medieval period especially was a uh, fashionable thing in certain circles. 
and at the heart of this interest was a reaction against the predominant industrialism and the capitalism that had degraded the rural countryside and swept the population into urban slums and eroded the former, former social ties that had held society together for time immemorial. From Thomas Carlyle's condemnation of the cash nexus that was the only thing to hold society together, to John Ruskin's aesthetic critique that capitalism and industrialism were hostile to the creation of genuine and beautiful art. Many idealized the Middle Ages as not only more romantic, but also a time when the various classes lived in a symbiotic relationship with one another, caring for each other, in contrast to the sordid, ugly confusion around them where the wealthiest preyed on the weak. So, in this context, fantasy was born as an alternative vision, a rebellion against the status quo. And I want to be clear here about one thing. The word fantasy was actually not used to describe the genre until actually the late 1940s. Uh, if, if you look up in the Oxford English Dictionary, uh, it cites the first instance in 1949 as actually the title of the magazine, the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, which was for its first issue actually just the, the magazine of fantasy. And by the 1950s, the word fantasy was used much as we use it today to describe the genre. And I'll be using it sort of retrospectively to apply to works of fiction long before 1949 as well. So before what I'm calling fantasy came around in the 19th century, it had a predecessor in the Gothic novel, which was actually the first one uh, was written in 1764 by uh, Horace Walpole, the, actually the first one in English, and that's the Castle of Otranto. Uh, so Gothic literature has uh, uh, much in common with fantasy and horror, and it's kind of a predecessor of both in some ways. Another very important development in the 1700s and early 1800s was the collection of fairy tales, like uh, the very famous Grimm's fairy tales, for example, and fantasy took much from these as well. And there was also very important historical fiction being written before fantasy, uh, much of it with uh, medieval inspiration. For example, Sir Walter Scott's Ivanhoe. And finally, we get to something that is um, almost recognizable as fantasy, and that is Sarah Coleridge. She's the daughter of the famous poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And she wrote something called Phantasmion, which was uh, published in 1837. And it is recognized by many as the first fairy tale novel in English. And it was also a very important influence on George MacDonald, who many people claim is the first person to write a fantasy novel for adults. His fa uh, Fantastics was published in 1858. George MacDonald was also, uh, importantly, a, a big influence on both Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, especially the latter. Uh, his uh, Fantasties was actually one of those enter-another-world type fantasies, where you have the character going from our world to another world. And that is, of course, a, a clear model for Lewis's Narnia tales. But the first author to portray uh, fully realized fantasy worlds that exist in the imagination completely and independently of our world was William Morris. William Morris was a craftsman whose firm made medieval-inspired tapestries and furniture and stained glass windows and wallpaper and, and decor. He uh, founded also the Kelmscott Press in order to make books that were as beautiful as those that came hundreds of years before. He was, in his lifetime, a very famous poet and writer and translator of Icelandic sagas, and eventually he became a committed socialist. And so there is very important social critique inherent in what were then called his prose romances, what we would recognize as fantasy, essentially, and they were published in the late 1880s and in the 1890s. The House of the Wolfings and the Roots of the Mountains were actually semi-historical, while the story of the Glittering Plain, the Wood Beyond the World, Child Christopher and Goldilyn the Fair, 
the well at the world's end, the water of the wondrous isles, and the sundering flood are all set in imagined worlds. These stories involve a naive protagonist who is forced out into the world and who would then go on many adventures and would encounter these hierarchical, often urban societies where the powerful exploit the weak. And the hero would need to become fully realized during his or her adventures uh, so that he or she could return home and transform society or defend their little corner of the world from the evils of hierarchy. Also, and very importantly, Morris's fantasies feature a very archaic English, a, a sort of uh, idealized medieval type English that never actually existed in any time or place. And, and as, a, as a result, they're actually kind of hard to read. Don't look for them on the New York Times bestseller list. And to be honest with you, the characters are uh, definitely on the flat side. Oh, and also uh, some of them include some nice poems, if you like to read poems while you're reading uh, your fantasy. Uh, if any of this sounds familiar, uh, let me read a, a letter written by uh, young J.R.R. Tolkien, um, who in uh, 1914 was writing to his wife, uh, or actually he, at the time he was engaged to her, to Edith Bratt, and uh, what he wrote is, amongst other work, I am trying to turn one of the stories, which is really a very great story and most tragic, into a short story somewhat on the lines of Morris's romances with chunks of poetry in between. Later in life, uh, Tolkien, as a much older man, acknowledged the important influence of William Morris on his fantasies in a letter from 1960. And in this letter, he is talking about uh, some of his influences. He says, The dead marshes and the approaches to the Moranen owe something to northern France after the Battle of the Somme. They owe more to William Morris and his Huns and Romans as in the House of the Wolfings or the Roots of the Mountains. So there you have it. But in between William Morris and J.R.R. Tolkien, of course, there were many other important figures who contributed to the genre, so let me talk about them for just a bit. So after William Morris and the other pioneers of fantasy, the early 20th century saw a number of fantasy authors, uh, such as Lord Dunsany, E.R. Edison, uh, T.H. White, and Mervyn Peake. Another huge development was the publication of pulp magazines in the 1920s, uh, beginning with uh, Weird Tales and also uh, subsequently, there was Unknown, and as I mentioned earlier, the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. These gave rise to actually many careers uh, as fantasy writers, and they also gave a home to sword and sorcery writers like Robert E. Howard of Conan the Barbarian fame, and also it gave a home, some of these magazines, to uh, women pioneers in the genre like C.L. Moore. However, perhaps the biggest influence on the genre as we know it today, and its greatest popularizer, was J.R.R. Tolkien. His The Hobbit was published in 1937, but it was really The Lord of the Rings, published in 1954 and 1955, that transformed the genre, primarily in the 1960s when it leapt across the pond and gave all the hippies here in the United States the perfect models in Gandalf and Galadriel. Like William Morris's prose romances of the late 19th century, Lord of the Rings also contains an anti-industrial bias and also a counter vision to the status quo and the ugliness of the reality around us. It offers a keen sense of beauty and wonder, as well as the catharsis of an incredible journey. Following Tolkien, the genre absolutely exploded. One of my favorites, uh, Ursula Le Guin's Earthsea series uh, is from the late 1960s, and it really showed how the genre could incorporate alternative visions. Also, Tolkien had both his imitators, like Terry Brooks in his enormously successful Sword of Shannara from 1977, and there were those who forged different paths, like Stephen Donaldson in Lord Fowl's Bane, also from 1977. In the 1980s, marketers of fantasy books were quite eager to claim that their authors were the next J.R.R. Tolkien. But there was an important shift in the genre in the 1990s. Uh, 
Robert Jordan's monumentally epic The Wheel of Time series is perhaps a great example of the shift uh, since it begins in a way that is very reminiscent of Tolkien, um, but it becomes something that is actually much more grim. But arguably one of the greatest influences on the genre after Tolkien is George R. R. Martin with his A Song of Ice and Fire series, which began in 1997, or as it's known to those people who don't read but watch television, Game of Thrones with loads of grit and morally gray characters and plentiful and often unpredictable deaths. A Song of Ice and Fire has uh, set the tone for fantasy. Uh, there are many grim, dark authors who have followed in its wake, uh, many thriving such as Joe Abercrombie and Mark Lawrence. Fantasy also continues to feature important themes and social critiques such as in Steven Erickson's The Malazan Book of the Fallen or N.K. Jemisin's The Broken Earth Trilogy. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the adventures of a certain boy wizard that were uh, initially published also in 1997. And of course, Harry Potter has been uh, one of the most important series in terms of the development of the YA fantasy genre. Today, fantasy has exploded into a number of subgenres. There's urban fantasy and epic or high fantasy and grimdark and steampunk and military fantasy, romantic fantasy and historical fantasy, just to name a few. It's become really wonderfully diverse and fantasy offers something to anyone with a willing imagination. I hope you've enjoyed this brief tour of the genre we all know and love. And if you love fantasy, please consider liking and subscribing to my channel as well as joining me for more conversations on some of the genre's best books in the future. Until next time.